What are you doing? Tomatoes, sausages, nice crispy bacon. We saved some for you, Mr. Frodo. Put it out, you fools! Put it out! That's nice! Malt beer, red meat off the bone. Potatoes. The finest weed in the South Valley. What's that? This, my friend, is a pint. It comes in pints. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to Binging with Babish, where this week we're returning to Middle Earth for part two of our 7 million subscriber special. And to answer your question, yes, there will be potatoes. But first up, hobbits, being basically British caricatures, take their tea time very seriously. So we're going to make a beautiful yeasted tea loaf in this recipe, courtesy of Paul Handshake Hollywood. Into the bowl of a stand mixer goes 400 grams of bread flour, 40 grams of granulated sugar, 10 grams of instant yeast, one and a half teaspoons of kosher salt, 60 grams of room temperature unsalted butter, and 120 mil each whole milk and water. In what's starting off as a pretty simple enriched dough recipe. We are then affixing dough hooks and kneading on medium speed for about 10 minutes. Just enough time so that not only all the ingredients are evenly incorporated, but the dough becomes soft and elastic and pliable. If you don't have a stand mixer, you can do this by hand, but it's much easier to just get engaged real quick and throw one of these things on your wedding registry. Once we've stretched our dough into a smooth taut ball, we're placing it back in the bowl, covering with plastic wrap and allowing to proof at room temperature for 60 to 90 minutes or until doubled in size. And not to burst your bubble or anything, but uh, the I don't have a follow-up to that, I'm just bursting this bubble. Now we've got to make our fruit filling into a medium bowl. I'm combining 25 grams of cranberries, 25 grams of raisins, and 60 grams of glazed cherries. To this, I'm going to add a teaspoon of ground cinnamon, mix it for absolutely no reason whatsoever, and then grate in the zest of three whole oranges, saving the rest of the orange for your other orange needs. Now you can go ahead and mix it together, and then it's time to marry it with our dough. We're gonna start by just, uh, well, just dumping it in there, and then lifting and dropping the dough on top of itself in order to incorporate the fruit. Once all the fruit is evenly dispersed throughout the dough, we're going to turn it out onto an unfloured work surface, pat it into a messy rectangle, and then fold it on its messiest side into a sort of torpedo, thus encasing all the fruit and giving us a relatively clean exterior. Then this guy's headed onto a parchment-lined baking sheet and getting covered with oiled plastic wrap, both to ensure that the dough does not develop a skin and that its growth is unimpeded, as it rises at room temperature for yet another hour Hour or until again redoubled in size. Then this guy's headed straight into a 425 degree Fahrenheit or 220 degree Celsius oven for about 25 to 30 minutes or until deeply browned and its thickest point registers 200 degrees Fahrenheit on an instant read thermometer or 93 degrees Celsius. I'll get used to this. Then whilst our loaf cools completely, we're making a very simple icing out of 200 grams of confectioner sugar and 45 grams of low fat milk. Make sure the loaf is totally cooled, otherwise it will absorb your icing spread it over top, let it naturally drizzle down the sides, and there you have it, an iced tea loaf. <laughs> an, an iced tea loaf? It's, um, it's, a, it's a play on words. Anywho, next up is a salmon and dill quiche, the base of which will be a pie crust, the same recipe that we used for our mince pies, which is why I'm fast forwarding. We are unfurling our crust into a nine inch tart pan, lifting and dropping and gently pressing into the corners, trimming off the edges, leaving a one inch overhang, docking with a fork, lining with aluminum foil, and filling with the pie weights of our choice. This guy's headed into a 375 degree Fahrenheit or 190 degree Celsius oven for about 30 minutes, or roughly 30 metric minutes. Just gotta find a place to put down my hot pie weights here. Not there, not there. Well, it looks like I am out of surfaces. This guy's going in my bedroom. Then I'm trimming off most of the overhang. We left this overhang to prevent the crust from shrinking inward too much. But now that it has set, it's headed back into the oven for another 10 minutes or until golden brown. We're letting that cool completely on a wire rack while we contend with our filling. First up, the fibrous leek, whose white and light green parts we're going to cut in half and thinly slice. Make sure you hang on to those green leaves, though. Once cleaned, they're excellent for making stock. But as for our thinly sliced half moons, we're going to saute them in some butter for about 10 minutes, tossing frequently and covering as necessary until they're nice and soft, but not at all brown. Oop, whoops, mine got a little brown. Until they're nice and soft and just a little brown. For the egg filling, we're turning to America's Test Kitchen, where they suggest a super simple and low profile custard of two large eggs, a half a cup of half and half, and a tablespoon of chopped fresh dill that we're going to lightly beat together before adding our cooled 
leeks. Make sure they are cool enough to touch before adding. We're also going to season with a few twists of freshly ground black pepper and a generous pinch of kosher salt before mixing gently just enough to incorporate the leeks and seasoning. Then we're pouring this mixture into the bottom of our prepared tart pie thing, then placing back into the same 375, 190, whatever oven for 20 to 25 minutes until the center is firm to the touch but still slightly jiggly to the touch. We're letting that cool completely one more time before dressing it up with some salmon. Now I had this idea to make a sort of salmon lattice by cutting strips of salmon and laying them down and interleaving them the way that you would a pie crust if you're making a lattice pie crust. And uh, I don't know how I feel about the result. It's definitely cool and middle earthy, but it's also kind of creepy to have made a lattice out of flesh. But at least it's not, you know, man flesh. Anywho, speaking of flesh, we have to figure out our main course for dinner, the biggest hobbit meal of the day. Gimli mentions red meat off the bone. Well, eat your heart out, Gimli. I got a four bone tomahawk rib roast here with your name on it. But not to get pedantic about it, it's much easier to remove the meat from the bone before roasting. So I'm gonna carefully remove the roast from the rib rack and season generously all over with kosher salt and freshly ground pepper. Before placing it back on the rib rack, set in a rim baking sheet to catch any drippings and placing it in the fridge overnight. This is both going to deeply flavor the meat and desiccate the exterior, which is gonna give us a deeper golden brown crust. The next day, once we get it out the fridge, it's time to let it rest at room temperature for two hours so it roasts more evenly. Then I'm going to tie the roast back to the rib rack using four strands of butcher's twine. We don't want this beast slipping and sliding around in the oven. And then we need a way to make full use of all of its drippings. So into the intended roasting pan, I'm going to lay down a layer of roughly chopped onions, a few cloves of garlic, and then I'm going to set them a swimming in two cups each chicken stock and dry red wine. I'm also going to throw a couple optional herbs in there, a few sprigs of rosemary and thyme, maybe a bay leaf or two if you're feeling really wild. And then what we've done here is create a base for our roast that is both going to reduce and concentrate in flavor as well as catch all those delicious drippings. As this guy spends anywhere from three to five hours in a 300 degree Fahrenheit or 150 degree Celsius oven until its thickest point registers, oh, gotta close the fridge. Sorry about that. Until its thickest point registers 120 degrees Fahrenheit or 50 degrees Celsius. I know that sounds kind of low for this big a joint of beef, but its temperature will continue to rise by as much as 20 degrees after being removed from the oven. So 120 degrees Fahrenheit is really going to end up more like a medium. Now onto this stuff in the bottom of the pot, which is kind of like the fond of roast beef. That doesn't really make sense, but regardless, we're straining out all the solids and allowing the fat to rise to the top. It should take about 15 minutes. Then we've got to skim off all this fat and hang on to this. It's beef tallow. It's got plenty of uses. And then what little remains is our jus. You know, that incredibly delicious liquid that you dip your roast beef into that tastes more like roast beef than roast beef. Speaking of roast beef, we're wrapping our roast beef in aluminum foil and letting rest for at least 30 minutes up to an hour and a half before slicing and serving. Next up, there's apparently only one way to eat a brace of conies. To find out how, stick around after the commercial break. So conies are a fanciful and antiquated way to refer to rabbit, prepared simply and rustically by Samwise Gamgee over an open fire. I'm gonna start by trimming any excess fat off the rabbit and cutting it into stew-sized chunks, leaving the bones intact, seasoning lightly with kosher salt and preparing my cooking pot. I've got a nice hot fire that I'm setting my pot over because I wanna start by rendering out the liquid fat from my rabbit trimmings. So just like we did with the bear fat in the Red Dead Redemption 2 episode, we're gonna saute these scraps for a few minutes until they yield a few tablespoons of liquid fat, in which we're going to begin browning our bunny stew pieces. I regret immediately calling these bunny pieces. That really bums me out. Anyway, we're going to sear our coney pieces on both sides until they're lightly golden brown, in batches if necessary to avoid overcrowding the pot, and then in all the fat and fond, we're going to saute some wild mushrooms, seasoning lightly with kosher salt, which is going to help the mushrooms give up their liquid. Once the mushroom liquid has evaporated and the fungi are beginning to brown, we're going to add two small chopped shallots to the party, sautéing for about two additional minutes until softened, adding four or five crushed cloves of garlic and sautéing for about 30 seconds or until fragrant, or as fragrant as sautéed garlic can be over an open fire, and then we are deglazing with one cup of dry white wine, along with four cups of chicken stock, preferably from Wegmans. I don't know if they have Wegmans in Middle Earth, but it's the most magical place I know of. You're welcome for the free advertising Wegmans. Keep it being awesome. 
I'm also gonna add a couple sprigs of thyme and four medium parsnips peeled and chopped. Then we're gonna nestle our seared pieces of coney in throughout the stew, bring the whole thing to a simmer, try our very best to pretend that we're not seeing me in shorts right now, and let this stew stew for about 90 minutes until the rabbit is nice and tender. This recipe, ironically from Simply Recipes, came out way better than I expected. In fact, I think it really only needed one thing. Potatoes. So we're gonna boil some, mash some, and stick them in our stew. I got about a pound and a half of Yukon Golds here that I'm gonna cut into one inch pieces, leaving the skins on, dumping them into a large stock pit and covering them with cold water. Adding a generous pinch of kosher salt, bringing them to a boil, and cooking for 15 to 20 minutes or until completely tender, draining, adding a quarter cup each melted butter and half and half, seasoning with kosher salt, freshly ground pepper, and getting to mashing. And that's it. These potatoes are especially for you, Sam. Thank you for looking after Mr. Frodo for us. Taste for seasoning, and then, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to plate this whole freaking thing up. I'm gonna try to walk you through which dishes for each of the seven meals, but first, hang on a second, just gotta adjust the camera here. There's no way we're gonna fit everything in this frame. There we go, that ought to do it. And now, with Jess's help, I'm gonna start setting out our spread. Coffee, tea, tomato, sausage, and nice crispy bacon, and lembas bread for breakfast. Bread, jam, and smoked salmon and leek pie for second breakfast. Seed cake, honey cake, coffee, and tea for elevenses. Cheese, apple tart, and ale for luncheon. Tea loaf, butter, jam, and of course, tea for afternoon tea. Rib roast with Yorkshire pudding, ale, and mince pies for dinner. And for supper, rabbit stew with mashed potatoes, salted pork and wine. And that's it folks, seven Hobbit meals, all served at the same time. Why? Because, well, you don't get to seven million subscribers without a few decent thumbnails. Thank you guys so much for watching and helping me reach this milestone. You have always and continue to change my life. And I'm really excited to show you what we have coming in 2020. So here's to you all, thank you again, and a special thanks to Jess who I could not have made this episode with a- What's that? This, my friend, is a pint. It comes in pints? I'm getting one. This is crap. Oh, I got out of camera. Yay! <laughs>